data center networking papers do you think have been published since this field started? Maybe a few thousand, I would guess. So how come out of these thousands of papers, you know, solving real problems, uh, only a handful got deployed and even those not everywhere? What's missing? What we believe is missing uh, are abstractions for data center networking. So what we did mostly for data centers was to just take the abstractions from the internet. And that was IP, congestion control to share capacity, and then load balancing um, traffic across multiple paths using Perflow ECMP. So of course you can just take IP and use it in data centers, that's not a problem. But when you take congestion control and in-network queues to do sharing, you get some issues. One issue is, is shown here where you have a TCP and an RDMA sender using DCQCN congestion control. And they're sending to the same destination, right? And they're just sharing uh, the link at the receiver. There's no isolation in the network. So we ran this experiment and basically what you get is that the cubic flow just literally starves the RDMA flow. And of course, depending on how you set up your network, you could have the RDMA flow starving the TCP flow and so forth. And this is just one problem that in-network sharing will, will give you. Incast is another example where uh, you get the, uh, a really bad outcome. And overall, this leads to high latency, high packet drops, and overall bad performance. Data center networks are well known to have multiple paths between any pair of hosts, right? And to, to spread traffic across these paths, we, we basically use Perflow ECMP. So these two hosts might, have, uh, might be using this path, and then when these other two flows are communicating, there's a good chance that they'll be hitting the same path and basically uh, have a collision. And collisions happen quite a lot and they result in really poor performance. And prior work has shown that in the worst case, you could be wasting up to 60% of your network capacity uh, just because of collisions. All right, so we, we sort of know all of these problems. They've been known since data center networks first appeared. So what has been the response from the networking community? Well, this is the response in a very brief way, in a, a very brief slide. So first we started with applications using the SoCAD API and the TCP IP stack. And then people came up with extensions, including ourselves, with extensions to TCP to cope with collisions and to cope with incas, like MPTCP and DCTCP. Then people figured out that the SoCAD API was just not fast enough and they started using the Verge API. But then of course you needed for RDMA to cope with, uh, with collisions and to cope with incas. So you have new versions of RDMA for that. And then you came up with different APIs like message APIs and you know, new host transports were developed to solve different problems. And to support all of these, we have a lot of hardware mechanisms in the network that are not always available, but they support particular uh, enhancements. So now you have this web of dependencies between the host stacks and the network transports. And in principle, you could deploy any of these in the network, but you just have to make sure that you properly isolate these things because they will fight each other and this will result in actually really poor performance. And that's the fundamental reason why data center networking is actually ossified today. And it's very difficult to deploy new things because very few parties control both the stacks and, and the infrastructure. We're trying to, to, to write this, this state of affairs. And what we propose is a no novel architecture for data center networking that's based on the concept of an edge queued datagram service. In short, this thing sits underneath the host stacks and gives them a uniform view of what the network is doing. And this view is basically a queue at the sender that, that then will send you congestion signals when you're trying to overflow it. But under the hood, eQDS will use multiple network backends that depend on the type of hardware you have available in your network and will we'll, we'll, we'll basically get the packets across the network as, as quickly and uh, without, uh, without uh, network buffering, uh, if possible. Okay, so let's see this in a bit more detail. So we've got two senders on the left and one, one receiver on the right. And if you just use TCP, TCP will just start sending packets without asking too many questions. And these have to be buffered for TCP to figure out whether it's sending too fast. Now, if you have enough of these senders, you get huge incast, and then you either had, have a lot of buffering or a lot of loss, and this is bad. What we propose is to basically add a layer between the host stack and the network interface, and, and the wire, basically. And this layer will, will somehow mediate the packets before they go into the network. And from the point of view of the host stack, 
this layer provides a virtual interface, right? And the host stack sends, uh, and there's no modifications to the host stack. And then these packets get buffered in this layer, in this EQDS layer. And they only get transmitted in the network when the net network is ready to accept them and when the receiver is ready to accept them. Actually, the receiver plays a central part because it dictates when packets can be sent to it. And it does so by sending grants. So these grant packets will allow senders to send packets. Okay? And by sending grant packets paced out at the appropriate rate, then the receiver can ensure that its incoming link is fully utilized while uh, not, creating, not causing buffering um, on its incoming link. So, in short, EQDS takes the buffering out of the network and moves it to the sending edge, okay? Now, networks are multipath. So, besides just taking the buffering out, EQDS will use, this to, uh, will use this to load balance the network appropriately. So, we add, we add entropy to every packet to make sure that every packet takes a different, uh, probabilistically different path in the network and that all paths are basically loaded equally. And of course, it can result in reordering. That's why we have a reorder buffer to destination, and packets are released to the receiving stack only when they are in order. Now, you may already be thinking that this is expensive because this buffer can get large. Actually, because the latency in the network is so low and we keep the buffering to the minimum, these reorder buffers are normally just tens of packets in the worst case. So they're actually quite cheap to maintain. Uh, of course, the network can lose packets in, in many cases, and um, this happened here with this yellow packet. EQDS will detect these by using control packets and will actually retransmit these lost packets. So what this provides to the sender and receiver, it provides the illusion of a, almost like a perfect network. The sender can still drop packets, so the TCP can still drop packets, but it's going to drop them in its sending queue, in the send, sending EQIF, rather than in the network. Uh, and TCP is completely fine with dropping packets, so that's, it, it's fine if we just run a drop tail queue for, for TCP on the sending host. However, for our DMA, we, we run a different, um, a, a, a different type of queue where we provide ECN, ECN markings and CMP packets to slow our DMA down and sending too fast. Okay, so if you apply this, we can actually dictate how the traffic is shared between the, the different senders. And you remember our previous example when I showed you that TCP is, is, is starves RDMA? Well, with EQDS, if you run it on top of EQDS, you get perfect sharing. Okay, so that's, that's the overview, right? Let's look in, a, a little bit into some details. So what we need to get EQDS working is basically a backend that depends on the hardware you have in your network, and then a tunnel protocol that is efficient and a host API that, that is efficient to implement. So let's look at the backend. Our preferred backend is one that depends on packet trimming. So packet trimming is, is this uh, idea we presented in SICOM 17 a few years ago, where basically, if you want to start sending, you just go at line rate. So in this case, we have three senders. They each start at line rate, send, uh, send the packets they had to send. And then the switch has a normal data, uh, data buffer but it also has a separate header buffer. So when the data buffer gets full because there's too many packets going into it, instead of dropping the remaining packets, you just cut the payload and put the header in this header buffer that is serviced with priority. These headers tell the receiver what the demand is. So now the receiver has enough information to know who is trying to send to it, and it will actually pace the pool packets in a way that the incoming link is always full, the buffer utilization is very small, and everything is, is, sort of, is sort of perfect. So this is really great because you could start at line rate, so most of the time this will be perfectly fine, but in the rare cases where you have problems, then you can recover very quickly and very cheaply. And of course this needs hardware support. So we've implemented hardware support for trimming in, Intel Tofino, uh, in the Intel Tofino switch, and it actually, mirrors very well the optimal implementation we have done in a simulator, so it's quite remarkable. But there's also implementations available for NVIDIA and Broadcom switches. So already, you know, you can have trimming in your, in your network if you want to. And if you have trimming, having buffers as low as 12 packets per port is sufficient to give you maximum throughput. Okay, 
if you don't have trimming, what do you do? Well, we use another backend that uses request to send, and this is similar to the one RMA paper Google proposed a while back. So in this case, our senders will first send, in the first RTT, we'll say, I want to send this many packets. And these RTS packets go to the receiver and they bootstrap the pool queue. And then from this, on, from this point on, it acts exactly like it was acting before. So with RTS, you basically waste one RTT when the flow starts, and then you're back to receiver-driven mode uh, like before. Okay, so how does this look on the host? On the host, you'll have a bunch of networking stacks. In this case, we have a TCIP IP stack and an RDMA stack. For each of these, EQDS will have a virtual interface that's called the EQIF, okay? So we have two EQIFs here. Whenever a packet is created to go to some other host, EQDS will create a tunnel to that destination on demand. So the tunnel is not pre-set up, it's created on demand, and it's a zero RTT setup. The tunnel state is actually soft state, so it can be dropped if there's memory pressure. And in the paper, we show uh, that actually the memory requirements of EQDS are, are quite modest and, and easily uh, feasible in practice. So of course, if the RDMA stacks are trying to, uh, to communicate, they will reuse this tunnel, so you have a single tunnel per host pair. And of course, you know, if these native stacks communicate, then you create another tunnel and so forth. You get the idea. Okay, so how do you deploy this stuff? Well, we have a DPDK implementation, um, and for details, you can look at the paper, but the key takeaway is that on a single x86 core, our implementation can saturate a 100 gigabit link with three kilobyte packets, so it's actually pretty fast. We also have a kernel implementation, um, and of course this is a bit slower because it's, it's the kernel, but it still can do around 50 gigabits with jumbo grams. And when you add EQDS, obviously there's a cost for encapsulating and decapsulating, so compared to the normal uh, ping you get, you, you add around 4 to 10 microseconds depending on where you deploy EQDS. So these are the options you have when deploying EQDS. So you could have an unmodified host, but if you have a smart NIC, you can put uh, EQDS on the SOC on the smart NIC and literally divert the traffic through it, either RDMA traffic or TCP IP traffic. And we've done this for, for two makes of smart NICs, one from Broadcom and one from, um, from uh, NVIDIA. The other approach is in a virtualized environment, EQDS sits underneath the virtual switch and, and then uh, does its tunneling there. And finally, if you have a bare metal Linux machine, you can use our kernel module for it. Okay. So let's see how this performs. Here we have two racks, one with storage clients, one with storage targets. The clients will, will basically issue reads and writes to random servers. And then what you expect is for normal RDMA to suffer from collisions and to get lower throughput, whereas with EQDS, the uh, per packet load balancing should help. So you run the same unmodified RDMA NIC over EQDS, but you expect better performance. And you see here that as long as you have enough requests, enough storage requests in, in, in your queue, you actually get between 10, 10 to 30% better throughput with the QDS. To test scale, we went to Amazon and used our RTS backend because there's no trimming support for Amazon. And we rented 1,000 VMs. And basically, we started by pinging the one destination VM that we designated as destination, and we ping it, and you know, when, the, when the machine is idle, it, it, you know, the, the, the ping is around 50 microseconds. But then we created 850 iPerfs to the same destination and kept pinging, and this is, this is the resulting latency you get. So you get nine milliseconds worth of buffering in the Amazon network. Now, if you do the same thing with EQDS, the baseline ping is five microseconds slower, but then during the incast, you just add 20 microseconds in the media. So this is really managing to keep the buffer low in the network. Well, what happens if you say run BBR against Cubic to the same destination? And this is the, share, this is the, the, the type of throughput distribution you get with the, with the, with the legacy uh, solution, with the baseline uh, network. If you run it over EQDS, it's almost perfect. And then we tested all the available congestion control on Linux against Cubic, and it's, it's, it's almost perfect. There are some outliers there. You can look at the paper to understand what they are. OK, so in summary, we proposed an abstraction that's called an edge queue datagram service. And the key idea of the abstraction is to stop sharing the network using in-network buffers and move these buffers to the sending hosts. And this allows you to improve TCP, IP, and RDMA traffic transparently 
by creating backends that can really exploit the capability of the network. So our backends, they use per packet load balancing and reordering. They use trimming when available or they use request to send. Of course, if your network has other hardware support, you can create a backend uh, for it. Because of this receiver-driven approach, you can, you can pretty much dictate any type of sharing you want. You could even starve a sender completely if, if that's what you wanted, right? So you can uh, share uh, the capacity arbitrarily. And something that we haven't really shown in this paper but we're actively working on is that you can actually create new transports that, that um, you know, are easy to deploy because now they can just be deployed on top of EQDS and you can innovate in the network because you know, then you have to just create a backend. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to take questions. Thank you.